project was provided in part by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and the Indiana Department of Natural Resources Lake Michigan Coastal Program. This project is made possible by the Indiana Arts Commission, South Shore Arts, and the National Endowment for the Arts, a federal agency, and has been made possible through a grant from Indiana Humanities in cooperation with the National Endowment for the Humanities. On a mild fall day in 1896, a handful of locals gathered around to see who some described as the wild man of the dunes. They observed a well-dressed elderly man leading a group of daredevils to take turns running off a large dune on the shore of Lake Michigan. To the layperson, it might have looked like a group of men with a harebrained scheme to fly with the birds. To the people who knew the team and its leader, Octave Chenu. It was a day one step closer to solve man's ultimate problem, that of heavier-than-air flight. And that wild man? Well, he would be known as one of the most important civil engineers of his time, and the wind bearer that others would ride into history and world acclaim. Long before his experiments in flight, Octave Chanute was already a well-respected engineer with a history of groundbreaking projects. Chanute's story began as many success stories of his time, as an immigrant with the aspiration and the skills to change the world. Octave came to America with his father, Joseph Chanute, an academic from France in 1838. The father and son first resided in New Orleans, while Joseph took up a position at Jefferson College. Eight years later, Joseph and Octave would journey to take up residence in New York City, an experience that would have a strong impact on young Chanute. Young Octave experienced the difficulty traveling up the Mississippi, over the Ohio, across the Allegheny Mountains into New York City. And going by steamboat or having a horse pull a canal boat that was just not what he thought it ought to be. That trip opened his eyes what needs to get done. After graduating from the Charles Coudet School in 1848, Chanute was determined to find a high-tech job in the growing transportation industry. Since railroads were on the cutting edge of transportation technology, Octave set his sights on a position with the Hudson Railroad. He wanted something high-tech. And then he heard that the Hudson River Railroad was going to extend from New York City to Albany. And they needed layout and surveying. And he thought, there's the future. With no open positions available, Chanute offered to work for free to learn the trade. A few months later, he was officially hired onto the Hudson surveying crew as a chainman, the lowest rung of the ladder. Through the years, Octave rose through the ranks to become lead engineer on multiple rail lines, helping them lay tracks through the East Coast and the Midwest. He would also facilitate westward expansion while designing some of the most innovative and impressive bridges of his era. The extent of the U.S., the western U.S. at that time, was Illinois, Indiana. Well, Chanute helped the railways expand into Kansas and Missouri and all over. Chanute really designed quite a few bridges. Some of them are really famous. Through prestigious positions in multiple rail lines, leading design roles on groundbreaking projects like the Chicago Stockyards and New York Transit, and business ventures in real estate and wood preservation, Chanute amassed wealth and worldwide acclaim. But despite his success and rich family life, Chanute had a passion that was considered taboo to the high society that surrounded him. Society in general, most people, didn't believe that flying was possible. There were definitely visionaries that thought this was a real possibility, but the overwhelming majority of the populace thought these people were crazy. They were kooks. Most people viewed it the way we today might view anti-gravity, you know, things like that. Well, it's great for science fiction, but we're never really going to do this. Now, I'm speculating, but surely he would have had some kind of thought trying to decide, 
is this really worth it or not? Because he was very successful in his career, he had a wonderful family, he had wealth, but he also had a curiosity and a scientific interest and an engineering interest in it. Chanute saw manned flight as the ultimate engineering problem. And in retirement, he dedicated his time to the pursuit from his home in Chicago. When he was done with his day's work and with dinner, he would retreat to his study and write letter after letter after letter to experimenters in Europe and Australia, all across. And then he would track them down and say, hey, please tell me what you're doing. Chanute was still not ready to float his ideas out to the general public until he attended the Paris World's Fair in 1889. It was there at the Congress International de Aeronautique where he shared similar views about flight with some of the world's most prominent engineers. Upon his return to the States, he disseminated his research and theories to the public with a series of articles about flight in the Railroad Engineering Journal. He also led the highly visible aeronautical conference at the World's Fair in Chicago in 1893, the largest gathering of its kind in the United States. Sanud brought the people in that were already recognized authorities in something. Tesla was one of them, Alexander Graham Bell, Robert Thorsten from Cornell University, and Albert Zahm from Notre Dame University. These were all people that had a reputation of being solid businessmen, solid inventors. People from all over the world were there, and the attention of the world was on it. Really, it was the most significant public event pre-flight. After the Aeronautical Congress at the World's Fair in Chicago, Chanute would continue to legitimize the pursuit of human flight. Chanute and Matthias Forney, his friend and publisher, released a seminal book on aviation. Progress in Flying Machines, 1894, was probably the most significant book ever written on the subject of aviation. This book, for the first time, put it all together and had an enormous influence. By publishing about flight, he gave credibility from the perspective of a very well-known engineer that this was actually possible. He evaluated all the experiments, and by almost making it a textbook, it opened up for other people not to waste their time and money on something that really made no sense to do. By now, Octave Chanute was regarded as the world's foremost authority on aeronautics. He was known for his knowledge and judgment, but more importantly, for his generosity, openness, and willingness to provide support to novice and established experimenters alike. He was more than willing to help people, not only giving them information, but there are numerous cases where you give people money. He give people 200 bucks, 150 bucks, try this, try building that. He felt like the best thing to do was to do as much sharing as possible and somebody will be smart enough they'll put two and two together and they'll make it happen. A boom in flight experimentation followed with Chanute at the center of it all. While pleased with the efforts of flight experimenters around the world, Chanute wanted to put his own theories into practice and assembled a team to help test the new wealth of information. He first employed his neighbor, William Avery, a carpenter and accomplished sailor. He later brought on Augustus Harry, an experimenter who briefly worked with Chanute's peer, Samuel Langley, at the Smithsonian Institute. Some would say maybe this was the first actual aircraft design team. The team would bring Chanute's ideas to life, first creating kites and models of his designs. They made improvements on a monoplane designed by famous gliding pioneer Otto Lilienthal, and then instituted Chanute's designs into their first scale prototype, a multi-wing glider named the Katie Did. Next, the team needed a testing ground which would provide the proper conditions for gliding flight while satisfying Chanute's desire for safety. Fortunately, Chanute was well acquainted with the Duneland on Lake Michigan's coast in northwest Indiana. Chanute was looking for a high place to jump off of that if your experimental glider doesn't quite work, you're not going to be killed. So the Indiana Dunes along the lakefront where you've got strong winds coming off the lake was pretty much a natural spot. On June 22, 1896, 
the team boarded a train bound for Miller Station in present-day Gary, Indiana, and planned to camp for two weeks to conduct their experiments. It was perfect. Just a mile and a quarter from the train station at Miller Beach is the tallest dune accessible right down Lake Street. While seagulls flew effortlessly overhead, Chanute's team assembled their gliders on the ground. After a handful of disappointing launches of the monoplane, which was described as cranky, the team turned to Chanute's original design that Katie did. This prototype would satisfy Chanute's need to perform the gliding experiment, make changes, and compare the modifications. This was a multi-winged affair that had the ability to morph its geometry and try all different kinds of combinations of superimposed wings. And what we know today from aeronautical engineering is this was just playing with lifting surface arrangements of where's your primary lift and where's your tail. By moving him around, he was able to feel, because he didn't have a wind tunnel or anything like that, he was able to feel his way through to where he found the best configuration. It was determined that the most efficient wing composition was five wings in the front and one in the back. With that configuration, the Katy did perform far better than the monoplane glider and achieved flights of almost 100 feet, a rather successful outing for the first-time team. Inspired by the experiments at Miller Beach, Chanute quickly utilized the knowledge gained to develop new designs, which Avery and Herring implemented back in the Chicago workshop. Six weeks later, the team set out for the dunes in northwest Indiana once again. Hoping to avoid the attention that he garnered at the last encampment, Chanute chartered a boat to transport his crew and gear across Lake Michigan to an area known as Dune Park. When they came back the second time, I think they wanted a little bit more privacy. They basically had a camping life. There was a physician that was there. They might encamp for several weeks, but there might be only the equivalent of a day or two worth of good wind in which to get those experiments. The rest of the time was repairing, cooking, cleaning, waiting for the wind to blow, that sort of thing. So a lot of persistence and patience was needed. The first prototype tested on this outing was the brainchild of a Kentuckian named William Paul Budasoff. The device, known as the Albatross, was a glider ship requiring the construction of a large ramp to launch the vessel. Visiting reporters were impressed with the ambitious design, but the Albatross would prove to be an utter failure. The Albatross was highly successful, rolling down the slide once and then crashing. It never actually was airborne. But all the newspaper people admired it as being the flying machine. The Boston paper published a picture of it flying high in the air, even though it has never been in the air. But it looked fascinating, and everybody talked about it. They spent a vast amount of time and energy on this, and it just didn't pay off. And hey, that's what happens in engineering. We try stuff, and not everything we try works. There's failure, there's thinking about it, figuring out why something failed, and then there's trying something new. While the Albatross was rolling down the hill, hopes were high for Chanute's latest design to be tested. The structure would prove to be revolutionary for aeronautical engineering. One of the things that he used when building bridges was something called the Pratt Truss design. The whole idea being, as weight was put on the bridge, the cables would take up the strain. It wasn't that big of a jump for him to say, well, if I can take this basic design of a bridge, rather than having roadways have airfoils on it, maybe I can make a glider out of this. The multi-plane with the modified Pratt truss design performed well. Chanute recorded glides measuring over 300 feet. The launches amazed reporters and locals who ventured into the dune wilderness to witness the experiments. Even more impressive was the ease of use of the machine which allowed Chanute's uninvited guests to experience flight for themselves. This thing was so stable that after they established the fact that they had everything in the right spot and figured out how stable it was, and by just a little bit of body motion you were able to control it, they would actually let people that had wandered in fly it. 
they take some of the reporters and go, hey, you want to fly it? And off they go. In 1897, the team would venture to Indiana's dunes once again to refine their design and achieve even longer flights. Word quickly spread of the team's achievements, and aviators incorporated Chanute's wing design into their prototypes. One of those teams that relied heavily on Chanute's design and advice would come to play a pivotal role in man's quest for the air. Uh, he attended seminars and things over the time. And in about 1900, he got a letter from a guy named Wilbur Wright, who ran a bicycle shop down in Dayton, Ohio. Wilbur Wright decided to buy Chanute's book, Progress of Flying Machine. And then in May of 1900, Wilbur wrote a five page letter that he is ready to get more involved with mechanical flight. And that's how the friendship got started. He actually visited the Wright brothers in their early experiments. He would bring some of his crew down there. He's an older man and he's going back and forth to Dayton and Kitty Hawk. And it, in those days, it took time to travel. But he knew that it's going to happen soon. During his visits, he could see great potential as the two brothers from Ohio took Chanute's research to the next level. The Wrights, of course, were the first to achieve sustained, controlled, powered flight in December of 1903. And although Chanute was unable to witness the triumph firsthand, no one would be more excited about their success. The Wrights took it to the next level. I mean, he was all excited because proof is right there that flying can be done. And those guys did it. Chanute continued to innovate and spread knowledge of the Wrights and other experimenter successes to the aviation community throughout the world up until his death in 1910. News of his passing spread widely around the globe, and the people whose lives he had touched would tell of his many accomplishments on the ground and in the air for months to come. In a tribute to Octave Chanute in Aeronautics Magazine, Wilbur Wright put to words what most of the aviation community felt about his friend and mentor. By the death of Mr. O. Chanute, the world has lost one whose labors had to an unusual degree influenced the course of human progress. If he had not lived, the entire history of progress and flying would have been other than it has been. No one was too humble to receive a share of his time. In patience and goodness of heart, he has rarely been surpassed. Few men were more universally respected and loved. Today, Octave Chanute's name does not loom as large as it did a century ago, but his important legacy still lives on and is revered by those who have come to know the man once referred to as the crazy man of the dunes and ultimately as the patron saint of flight. Octave Chanute is still celebrated in many parts of the world, but maybe none so important as on the southern shore of Lake Michigan, where Chanute's team first launched off the dunes in the quest for flight. At the Gary Aquatorium in Miller Beach, dreamers, engineers, and flight enthusiasts can honor the man who stayed true to his ideals while devoting his life to useful, constructive work. On the Lake Michigan shore behind it, they could imagine developing the exciting discoveries that helped to change the world over a century ago. And at the Indiana Dunes National Park Visitors Center, the annual Aviation Day event celebrates Chanute and aviation progress just a stone's throw away from the site of Chanute's biplane experiments. In his time, Chanute encouraged openness, fostered collaboration to solve some of the biggest engineering problems of his day, and supported many other innovators whose names will live on in history books for years to come. Today, Chanute is held up as an engineering icon, a symbol of innovation, and a shining example of the American dream. He helped people move across the land and soar through the air. But we should remember Octave Chanute, not for what he accomplished and what he gained, but for how he accomplished them. If 
we can embody Chanute's values and approach to work, we'll find